Albert Einstein, Richard Branson, Bill Gates, John F. Kennedy, Tony Robbins, Michael Phelps, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of industries. What else do they have in common? Well, they all have ADHD, but you don't hear much about that, do you? You know what you hear even less about? The successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smartass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Otsuka. I'm an attorney, not a doctor, a lifelong student, not a coach. I'm also the creator of Cortography, a patent pending system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD, your superpowers, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest superpowers. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you, too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I am Tracy Otsuka, and I wanted to welcome you to episode 41 of ADHD for Smartass Women. Today, I've invited Lynn Minor Rosen to our podcast. Lynn is an ICF and board-certified ADHD coach, executive function coach, certified career development coach, and life coach, who works with high school seniors, college students, and young adults with ADHD, executive function deficits, and learning differences. Previous to coaching, Lynn was a special education teacher for 12 years. She was also an IEP coordinator. Lynn has a BS in business administration and two master's degrees in education and special education, and she lives in Boca Raton, Florida. Lynn, welcome. Hi, Tracy. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Oh, I'm so delighted that you're here. But before we start, I want to mention a couple things. First of all, I want to mention that you are not only an expert in all these areas, but you're also one of us. You oh, yeah. have also been diagnosed with a brilliant ADHD brain. Yes, in my 50s. <laughs> yeah, a lot of us have, haven't we? Yeah. Um, you're also, I understand, you're going to be speaking at Chad in November. Yes, which I'm really excited about because it's a big conference. Chad is children and adults with ADHD. And every year they have this large international conference and they have incorporated a lot of different coaching organizations and ADHD experts. It's an amazing event. So is Chad just for industry professionals or do you think it's for anybody who's interested in ADHD? Oh, no, but actually one day, the first day, Thursday, the day I'm speaking is mostly there for professionals. It is geared to professionals, but the rest of the conference is geared to educators, parents, families, professionals, anybody. Gosh, I wish I could go. I'm going to be in New York then, but I next year, definitely. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's amazing to have all these experts and all this information in one place. And they have, you know, three or four different speakers each hour. So you have choices of which to go to, So which is really great. No, it sounds fantastic. Yeah. And I've heard so many good things about it. Yeah. So Lynn, I wanted you on my podcast because I kept seeing the same question pop up in our Facebook group, ADHD for Smart Ass Women. And that question actually was threefold. It was, should I disclose my ADHD to my boss, work colleague, human resources, whomever? Mm -hmm. Number two, if I should disclose, how do I go about doing that? And number three, what do I do if I do disclose and then it's used against me later? Mm. But before we go into all that, I want to say that I did post a request for questions in our group. And in true ADHD fashion, they covered a very broad range from questions about the structure of career development coaching, mm -hmm. question from Adochi, how to find a career that doesn't just resonate for a moment, what kinds of careers are typically a good fit for the ADHD brain, why is freelancing so hard, Kat asked, how do I overcome rejection sensitivity in the workplace, Kat, go back to our cognitive behavioral therapy or cognitive behavioral coaching podcast. There's two of them. I think that's where you should start. So 
in any case, we had all these questions. And so what I think what I'd like to do, Lynn, is I'd like to address the disclose, not disclose question and the ADHD on the job strategies today. And then I'd love to have you come back and talk about ADHD, individual career fit, what career development coaching looks like, what kinds of jobs are good fits for those of us with ADHD that are beyond the ER doctor or nurse, Mm -hmm. the EMT, the policeman, the entrepreneur, the ones we hear about a lot. Mm -hmm. So I hope that's okay if if we kind of break it up like that. Absolutely. Uh, That's, there's a lot to talk about. I know there is. So do you want to start with the, should you disclose or not disclose? Or do you want to start with? So let me start with, and I want to preface, and I want to put this out there right now, that I am not a lawyer. And it is very important that if you have more complex questions about your individual situation, that if you want to know more about the law, that that would be somebody to go to. Yes. And I am a lawyer and I agree with you (laughs) completely. (laughs) So you understand where I'm coming from. Absolutely. It's it's important though, that people understand. So there's a, I'll just give an overview. There's a, in 1973, there's an American with Disabilities Act and a Rehabilitation Act. And what it says, uh, this law, that it protects individuals who meet four conditions. So first I want to talk about that it's important that to understand that just being diagnosed with ADHD does not automatically make somebody protected under this law. Oh, wow. Okay, because there are conditions to it. Uh, The first one is uh, you have to be considered an individual with a disability under the law. And there are really three types of disabilities that we talk about, and especially in the ADHD world, we talk about visible disabilities, people that you can see. They're using a wheelchair, or they have a seeing eye dog, or a prosthetic limb. So that would be a visible disability, and it's hard. You you really can't just not disclose that. Uh, The other part is what we call invisible disabilities or hidden disabilities, and those refer to things that are could be medical or mental or emotional or physical that are challenges that you have that are not really apparent to somebody right away. And that includes ADHD, uh, autism spectrum disorders, learning disabilities, mental health issues, or even other chronic medical conditions like diabetes. And there are a lot of people that don't disclose that have diabetes. And then there's another area about, I would say about 30% of the population of the disabled population has what's known as a visible or invisible disability, depending on the circumstance. So let's say somebody has really poor nighttime vision then they might need some sort of help or accommodation at nighttime, but during the day they're fine. Makes sense. Okay. So that's important to know what the disabilities could be. I'm sitting here kind of balking and wiggling in my chair every time I hear the word disability. (laughs) Yeah. But I know that we have to work within this framework to get the accommodations that we need to get at times. Correct. And that's what becomes very difficult. Is it a disability or isn't it Mm -hmm. for you at that job? So there are four things, four conditions you have to meet to be eligible under protection under the ADA and RA. And number one is you have to be qualified as an individual disability under the law. Uh, You have to be Qualified for the position with or without reasonable accommodations. So that's tricky. And it affects people who are being excluded from employment solely based on their disability. And that's who's covered by the law. Okay, so go... It's very complex. It's very confusing. So... Okay, go, can you go back through number two and number three? 
Yeah, so when you go for a job, when you apply for a job, ideally the employer is going to expect that you can do this job. Okay. And that you are qualified to do it with or without reasonable accommodations. It's kind of broad, but I want to just explain what the law says. And that's why it becomes so tricky to make the decision, should I or shouldn't I? And that's why it's so, why people ask that question, because, wait, the law says I'm, I'm an individual with disability. Isn't it black and white? No, it can be more complex. You know, are, there are going to be a lot of other questions. Well, it sounds like what you're saying, though, is that, yes, you have this disability, but despite that, if you couldn't qualify for the job to begin with, with, right. with the disability, then you shouldn't have the job anyway. It, it just right. seems really circular. It is. It is. It's very, and, and working the employment world going out there is also very confusing. I mean, we can say, yes, uh, you know, a job shouldn't discriminate against people that have disabilities, but we all know that there is a culture in each job that in, that you have to follow, you know, especially like somebody who's a teacher, you have to stand up and teach. You can't sit down. So you can say, well, I have a disability, so it's up to you. Is that going to be the right job for you or not? Gosh, I had no idea about that. I didn't know teachers have to stand up. Some do. Yeah. When I worked for the New York City schools, I had that to stand so up. That is so silly. <laughs> <laughs> so there are reasons for not disclosing. And the reason it, to think about that, I'll, I'll just go there is if you don't need accommodations. Lynn, okay, go ahead. Can, I, yeah. can I stop you for a yeah. second? Go so, ahead. Okay, you went over number, I'm just, you know, it's my brain and I'm kind go of ahead. walking it through. And so I'm sure people that are listening <laughs> are probably where I am. Okay. So, okay, I get number two now, even though it makes no sense to me. Number three was what again? Can you repeat it? Okay, so they have to be four conditions. Number one, they have to be considered an individual with disability under the law. Number two, they are otherwise qualified for the position with or without reasonable accommodations. Okay. Number three, that they are being excluded from employment solely because of their disability. So two and three seem to fight, which I think is what is I'm struggling with in my brain. Yeah, yeah. and a lot of people do, and even lawyers do. Mm-hmm. And then number three is... They number are number four. I'm sorry. They are covered by the federal law, the applicable federal law. Okay. And how are you covered by the federal law? It's you know, I, that I, that would have to be a lawyer. You know, okay. I, I, you know, those are the details that I'm not an expert at, um, and that's where it kind of gets tricky. I would assume it. It's certain certain occupations, right, and certain yeah. companies, and yes, okay. It is, definitely. So where would you like me to go next? What, what's, what's the next area we've, you'd like to dive into? Okay, so we've got the law. Mm-hmm. Now, let's say that you are starting a brand new job. Mm-hmm. And I guess my first question is, should you disclose your ADHD out of the shoot? That's the question that keeps coming up. Yeah. So it is up to you. This, this is also very complex. And there are reasons to disclose and reasons not to disclose. And ultimately, the decision is up to you because we know that ADHD is, you know, a big umbrella of different symptoms. And we have some are, have severe ADHD and some have mild ADHD. And it also really depends on the job you're doing. So every individual is different. Now, you don't, okay, so first I'm going to say is the most important thing is to try to provide, try to find accommodations yourself. So before you disclose or think about disclosing, You want to see what is that job that you're applying for and what's getting in the way or what would make it easier. So would it be 
better to come in early or stay late to avoid distractions or um, use an app to help you stay organized. I'll, and I'll give you a personal story for me as a teacher. I never disclosed. And, but I knew that I had a very hard time during my work day to get paperwork done. My day was unpredictable. I was busy. Even though I would set it aside for lunchtime, there would be interruptions. And by the end of the day, I was spent. And I'm sure a lot of people out there with ADHD feel the same way. At the end of the day, they're like, done. Can't work anymore. And it could be for a lot of reasons. You know, it could be you're taking ADHD medication that, that kind of disappears toward the late afternoon. So what I did is I noticed that I got in really early to work. It wasn't easy, but I got a lot of work done. It was quiet and no distractions. The boss was really happy. And when I checked out after school, nobody cared that I left right away. You know, some people stay late because they think it looks good. So instead, I came in early and, and I got the best parking spot. So it's really possible to come up with ways to create accommodations for yourself on the job without having to tell anybody or ask anybody. You know, the reasons why you should not disclose is if you don't need the employer to give you, make accommodations for you. Okay. So let's say you have ADHD and you're really struggling uh, there are a lot, I'm going to talk about that later, you know, what the challenges might be on the job and what you can do to make improvements for yourself on the job. And so that would be the first thing. Also, you might not want to disclose if you're doing really well at work and they're really happy with your work. Why would you tell somebody that you're having challenges? If you're doing really well, but they're really happy. It's just, these are things to think about. And these are, you know, a lot of things that I talk to my clients about to have them think about it. Because right away, we think, oh, I'm going to ask for accommodations because I'm entitled to it. But it, you have to think about it. It might not be the best decision. And the oh, other... total sense. Yeah. And if you feel that disclosing your disability is going to cause your supervisors or coworkers to treat you differently or discriminate against you, you have to really think about that. People don't really understand what ADHD is, and you might be opening up a can of worms if you tell people about that. You know, Rowan um, asked a really good question. She said, and I could totally see myself doing what she's saying here. If you've made the choice to bring up your ADHD, what are some good strategies for addressing it? For those with no personal experience, there's often a negative association that happens the instant you mention the acronym. I want to make my ADHD strengths clear without frantically sounding like I'm just trying to justify what I just disclosed or make excuses for myself. I mean, I find myself even in a non-job setting sometimes, you know, it's like, well, do you know that Richard Branson and, you know, Thomas Edison and blah. <laughs> yeah. But I on the completely flip side, relate to what she's saying. So I'm yeah. wondering, okay, so I get that if you really don't need the accommodations, it makes sense. Obviously, do not disclose. Now, I could say that once you're, you know, once you're the president of the company, then it might be a good thing to disclose because then other people see, oh my gosh, he did that with ADHD and probably because of his ADHD, right? Right. But we but, also know that, that everybody, you know, even though we struggle, we have so many positive yes. things that we can offer. And I think that's exactly what Rowan is saying. Yes. So if you decide that there, you know, you just, you have this one weakness and you can't overcome it in this job. So you, you have to disclose in order to keep the job. How do you go about disclosing it? How do you, you know, make mm. sure that they know, okay, these are my strengths despite this one weakness. Yeah. So there's actually a few steps before that, before you get to that point. Okay. The second thing, so the first thing I said is to try to 
come up with accommodations yourself. That's number one. Okay. And it's also possible to ask your boss to help you with things that are without disclosing why. You can say, you know what, I work much better if I'm not looking out a window. Or it's really, you know, if if you could let me write things down while you talk or take notes at our meeting, it would really help me. You don't have to tell people why. It's really nobody's business. And there's a lot, and here's the other thing that I faced, and I had this happen to me six months ago. I went to a networking event with a lot of professional women, super strong, you know, executives and decorators and all that. And somebody came up to me and said, what do you do? And I said, I'm an ADHD coach, a career coach, a life coach. She goes, isn't ADHD made up? (laughs) Doesn't everybody have ADHD? So here's a professional and I'm thinking, whoa, what if her coworkers had ADHD or somebody she's selling to has a kid with ADHD? So you want to be, have your guard up because people have preconceived ideas about what they think it is and what it isn't. Yeah. Well. And so you're, you're taking a, a real risk. So my second tip is to know who to talk to and what to say. You want to know whether, really think carefully, is there a benefit to disclosing to somebody at work? And when you do, you don't need to tell them all of your medical history. You don't need to tell them anything about medication or sleep or diet or anything else. And I'm going to go into the third thing. Or comorbid conditions. Exactly. You don't want to go into those details. And I would also think about who you would tell. Who would you ask? Is there somebody that you trust? Is there somebody that's your that's a part that you can you know, lean on at work? Most often, if you're in a big company, I would highly recommend going to HR first because it is not required for HR to tell your immediate boss. So you can have a conversation with somebody in HR and they can keep that information private until you decide that you want your boss to know about it. Do they have to keep it private if you say, I do not want my boss to know? That I don't know. Okay. And that's a gamble also because they can say, sure, sure, we'll keep it private. Right. Right. I mean, we've all, I've been in the business world forever and you never, and every company is different. And that's such a great strategy because you probably aren't the first person (laughs) and HR will know, right? Right. And, you know, here's the other thing too. When you interview for a company, if they're talking like, oh, we include everybody, we've got great programs for people with disabilities, we welcome people, you'll get a feel for that company and you'll know whether or not it's okay to disclose right from the get-go. Okay, so you have to know who to go to, mm-hmm. but s- start with the HR, right? I, I believe you should, unless you, have, unless you really, really trust your boss. But it's very interesting. There was a report in the Harvard Business Review. They did a study about ADHD on the job, and most people don't disclose. So... Uh, because they're very afraid. They don't know what to expect or what their boss will say. I had one client. He was actually a college student. He decided to tell his boss that he had ADHD. And the next day he came into work and he was, you know, running around and, you know, doing his work. And his boss said, oh, you must not have taken your ADHD meds today. Oh, no. That's real. So you want to, that's why I keep stressing how you want to be really careful about that decision. Absolutely. And I think you're right. It's because of all the misinformation. People don't know what it is, what it looks like. Right. There are accommodations that you, you have. The third thing I wanted to tell you is before you ask or before you go there, you want to know exactly what you're asking for. It is not the employer's responsibility to create accommodations for you. It is up to you to say, 
I need my desk in a different location, or I need to be able to wear a headset, or, you know, you need to have a specific list of things, but look very closely at these things. And are they going to be disruptive in your job, disruptive to other people, or is it going to cost a lot of money? Okay. Because they have to be reasonable. The employer so can you give is me not an example of yeah. accommodations that have been granted. Well, like I said, one of the ones is definitely where your desk is situated. You could ask them, could I sit instead of in this cubicle where I have very talkative people around me and it's hard for me to focus, but you never have to say ADHD or anything like that. You can just say, I would work better from another place. You could also reframe it and say, I work best when I use a tape recorder to help me remember everything new. Or I work best if I can write things down. So you can be very creative about things that you need without going into detail about your quote unquote disability. One of our members, Shannon, she asked, and I'm curious if this has ever been granted. She said, I, you're laughing because I think you read it. Can, yeah. can my tardiness be overlooked if I have ADHD? Can I get accommodations without discrimination? Especially if I can make it within 10 minutes or less of my scheduled shift. With the exception of always being late, my work reviews have been great. Uh hum. Embarrassing mm. as it is to admit, I was 56, I, I was late 56 times in nine months and I only work four days a week. In my defense, it counted even if I was one minute past the hour. Oh my gosh. Yikes. I worked so hard the rest of my 12 hour shift as an ER nurse. Of course, she's an ER nurse often staying late to accommodate the patient flow. The general anxiety of being late makes my anxiety worse, and I absolutely have feared for my job at times. The struggle is so real. Yeah. Have you ever heard of an accommodation around being late? No. And I, but, you know, you, again, it's based on what, the, uh, what, it's like, what, the, uh, what it's like at your job. I mean, there are some jobs that have flexible hours. So if you work in a career that has flexible hours – then that might be the best situation. But if you have a career... The best, though, is it doesn't matter what time it is. You know, if we have time blindness, we're exactly. always going to be a few minutes late. Yeah. And that's why I, you know, that's a big issue for me. And I had to really force myself to go into work early because yes. not only do we have time blindness, but we don't realize how it's going to affect us until later. We, we're in the moment. And what you need to do is really practice habits where you can address those things in advance and do it often. Like going in early would be, you know, you just have to really push yourself to do that because that's the, what the employer is expecting of you. Absolutely. And you can understand why, because the, the shift that was ahead of her is now leaving and there's nobody to cover. And I mean, I get it, but yeah. I also get where Shannon's coming from now. And in my personal opinion on this would be what has really, really helped me is I have clocks everywhere, mm -hmm. stuck on mirrors, stuck in my shower, anywhere where I get tripped up. It, it really does work. <laughs> and time management difficulties can be the biggest challenge on the job, yeah. for yeah. sure. But also, you know, I'm going back to the other question that Rowan had, is you can frame things with your boss to say, you know, I, I believe my strengths are really consistent with the tasks of this job. But if I could take the time to look over my notes in a quiet place before each meeting, I'll do even better. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great response because you are talking about why you're so valuable. Yes. So you want to reframe it and you want to put it from a standpoint of strength that this is going to make me a better employee. Okay. Now, I also want to tell you that if you don't disclose during an interview, uh, there are laws to protect oh, wait a you minute. there. Hold on one second. So we didn't even talk about yeah. that. Yeah. As far as you disclose in an interview, do you disclose after you have the job? I mean, it's all, it's, it's all, it depends, yes, right? Exactly. <laughs> there, you're an expert. Look at that. Uh, yeah. 
And and just because there's also some information where I've heard people say, well, you have to disclose during the interview or you can't get accommodations. And that's not true. I've heard that from a lawyer. You don't have to disclose during the interview. But if you don't mention anything during an interview, an employer is not allowed to ask you questions about the nature or extent of your disability. They are not allowed, you do not have to, they're not allowed to ask you questions about revealing that you have it before they make a job offer. And they can't ask you questions in written questionnaires or questions just made up in an interview about that. So it's almost like, (laughs) Lynn, I feel like the fact that that is the law would indicate to me that we shouldn't disclose. Yeah. If we feel that we are qualified for that job, yep. why the hell should we disclose? Right. I agree. And I had that I had that conversation with some people on your site and I did get a, pri- a couple of private notes about wait, that's my right. It's my right to disclose. They're not allowed to discriminate. But we all know that people you can't change their mind. Yeah. And I almost would want to be in a situation in a job where I show them first how valuable Mm -hmm. I can be and I am, and then ask for, okay, can I have, you know, an office with a door? Can I, you know, those sorts of things. Yes. Yes. Rather than coming in, I I mean, I'm thinking as an employer, I would think, oh my God, is that person going to be a total pain? Yeah. Yeah. And that's what also happens like that. My client where the boss thinks ADHD is going to make them not such a great employee or might have problems in the future or look at them different. Absolutely. Okay. So, so what else is there? So we decided that, yeah, probably don't disclose in the interview. Try to, to um, accommodate yourself. Yes. Initially. Or, or get a coach. And that's one thing I'm going to talk about next when we talk about what those uh, on the job challenges uh, might be. There are a lot of them. You know, if you work with a professional or a coach or somebody else, or even part, you know, really have somebody at work that can really be like a, you know, a, somebody you can talk to about it, uh, that's really a great way to help you with that. Absolutely. Ruth (laughs) Ruth had an interesting question. She said, I think about bringing in a part-time assistant, even a virtual assistant, if I were to go back to full-time work. I Mm. could work with them and manage their time if I just had the budget to work with. Mm. Any chance of getting that approved? I think it really depends on the job and what she's applying for. And she could probably, if she's in, has had that before in another job, she could bring that up in an interview and say, you know what has really helped me in advance? Do you have anything like that Mm -hmm. in your company? You do not have to say why. You don't have to say, I have ADHD and that's why. You can just say, I would, I really, in my last job, I did so well because I had somebody who was really detailed, experienced with details. And that's not my strong point. That's okay because you have other really good strengths. Exactly. Exactly. And my opinion here too is that honestly, if I really loved my job and there was, you know, the administrative detail part was the problem that I struggled with, I probably would hire a part time VA and I would go to someplace like onlinejobs.ph where, you know, they're VAs from the Philippines that Mm -hmm. very highly educated population, very good with English. They all speak English. And I would hire someone out of my own paycheck for five to six dollars an hour because I think ultimately it would make me that much better at my job. And you know, the, exactly. the more the better you are at something, the more people are going to want to throw money at you. So I think right. ultimately, I would absolutely do that. Yeah, or like I said, a career coach, a career counselor, mm-hmm. a psychologist, a social worker, anything like that that's going to give you support and other strategies. Right. Right. Exactly. Okay. That sounds great. 
So what else do we need to talk about? So let's on talk the- about these top 10 ADHD on the job challenges that I'm sure everybody listening going, I have that, I have that. <laughs> and we're all, again, we're all different. We all have different set of, of challenges and you're a unique person. So it's up to you to come up with those strategies that help you in your areas. So number one is time management. And we know that's a big issue uh, for everybody, young and old. So there are different things you can do. Uh, Break up your large projects into small pieces. You know, this is something we do in coaching. Reward yourself when you meet your due dates. You know, use alarms or planners or uh, software or an app to help you plan and remember meetings. And then the other thing is, is, you know, manage your time by really being aware of who you are and when you work at your best. So if you're crashing at five o'clock, don't make a meeting then. Try not to overschedule your day. So those are time management tips. Okay. Okay. You want me to go on? Yeah. I mean, I time management, though, to me, that would be the perfect, you know, the perfect person to work on that would be, you know, a, I don't know, a cognitive behavioral coach, a time, um, an executive function coach, you know, anybody that's more on the coaching end, though, that can help you put those strategies together. Because I think a lot of people say, well, yeah, I'm supposed to backward plan, but how do I even go about that? Yeah. They, you know, they just can't do it. Yeah. Okay. So So time management is number one. Yep. Number two is difficulty managing long-term projects. Yeah. So this could be the hardest organizational challenge for adults with ADHD. And it encompasses time management, organization, tracking, communicating, all of that stuff. So, you know, back to the same thing is really, you know, I even, this is something I share with my, with college students is, Breaking down your projects into manage- manageable parts. Don't plan on doing everything at one time because it will be very difficult. So if you can, do a little bit each day. Find a partner or a coworker that has good organizational skills. And then try to... If, you can, if you're offered different tasks, try to volunteer for the ones that are short-term tasks. So if there's a committee and they say, oh, you know, who wants to do this? Don't take on things that you know are going to be super challenging. <laughs> yeah. That seems pretty obvious. Career 101. But you, I know everybody wants to please their boss, but also be aware of who you are and what you can and cannot do. Uh, So number three, the number three challenge is paperwork or details. Uh, Finding important papers, turning in reports, timesheets, filing, all that stuff. And so there's a bunch of paperwork rules. Uh, Handle each piece of paper only once. And I know you have a lot of organizational people in 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 your group. Uh-huh. And they probably put that down a lot, but that's, a, that's something that a lot of people know about. You could also ask an administrative assistant to handle certain things. Like you said, find some, an assistant or find somebody to help you with that and delegate. Uh, keep only the papers that you need nearby. Throw out the stuff you don't need or file it. And then I love one of your, I forget the name of the lady in your group. She had an amazing filing system created with folders and labels. And that works. Franny. Yes, Franny. She's great. So if you need a different system than, let's say, the previous employee that had your job, their system is really difficult for you. Make your own system. That's a great idea because I don't think any of us with ADHD do well with those filing systems. <laughs> you know, it's out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. I never know where anything is. But the minute I moved to Franny's clipboard system, 
I am completely organized on my desk. And so I can walk in and right away I can get to work. I, I completely agree with that. I think that's a, a great idea. But we have the sense, well, that's how it's always been. So mm. we've got to keep it that way. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with saying to your boss, hey, I have a different system of organizing. Do you mind if I change it? There are very few bosses that are going to say no. And I believe that whatever works well for the ADHD brain works equally as well for the non-ADHD exactly. brain. Exactly. Exactly. And you don't ever have to say that I have ADHD. You could just right. say, I do it differently. Okay. So number four is procrastination. Ugh. Uh, <laughs> so again, I feel like I'm saying the same thing over and over again, but it really takes habit is to just break the tasks into small pieces and reward yourself along the way. So it might be rewarding yourself with a new CD or a long walk with your dog or dancing or buying new lingerie, whatever it is. <laughs> you know, make it like, okay, if I get this done, then I'm going to do something nice for myself. Yeah. And also, you know, the Pomodoro method, mm -hmm. of, yep. you know, because we just need to start. Usually yeah. when we start, we can, you know, we can't stop. But it's this whole idea of if we just start. And, and I think what happens, I know with me is all this stuff starts going in my, into my brain. I don't want to start. I don't want to do this. I'm not good at this. And if you could just shut all that down and just friggin' start using the Pomodoro method, and if you don't know what that is, you can Google it or go into our group. We're always talking about it. We, you just need to start. Yeah, or get a partner, you know, working on teams. Yes. Or ask Body the breath. coworker, say, hey, I'm, can we sit down and do this together? Because I got to get this done, and I'm, like, not doing it. You don't have to say why. <laughs> just say right. it. You can also ask your supervisor, I need a deadline. When do you need this by? Yes. Okay. So that'll help. Okay. Uh, number five is poor memory. So this also affects people on the job. Deadlines, mm. working with a team. And this, I remember this being my biggest challenge when I was in the fashion industry. And I was a buyer in the fashion industry. And you were expected to remember all your numbers. How much sales? How much did store number one do? How much did store number 50 do? You know, and it was really hard for me with memory. So that would have been a situation where I could have, I would have said to somebody, would it be okay if I write it down? Or if I look at my notes, it's really hard for me to remember. You could also use a tape recorder or uh, take a lot of notes. That was for me, that always worked, is taking notes. Tape recorder is tricky, but you could ask your boss easily. You know, I, I want to remember everything that's happening in these meetings because they're so important, and I want to be the best employee I can be. Do you mind if I record it? Yeah. There's also those little pens, right, that yeah. you can just record. Yeah. You, nobody even knows. And also, Although there's, an sure app, there's an app on your phone. I don't think oh, it's that's right. legal. If you're using it for yourself and you're not sharing it, you're just using it so you mm -hmm. can remember what you heard to be a better employee. Okay. So What's you, number six? Oh, going back to, do you want some more tips on memory or do you want me to go on? I think we should go on. Okay. I just, I'm always concerned about the ADHD brain and how long my podcasts are. Okay. <laughs> well, how about if I create a checklist for your audience? That would be perfect. Okay. So we're that would gonna, be great. Yeah, I will do that. So number six is distractibility. And that's where you would want a quiet cubicle. Uh, maybe think about taking your phone calls only at a certain time of day. Uh, mm -hmm. Have a notebook near you to jot down ideas when you get, when you think of something and keeping ideas, you know, right there near you. And also, you know, maybe even listening to a, head, a headset. Ask your boss once in a while, hey, do you mind if I put a headset in and listen to some white noise? It just helps me work better. Yeah, that's a great idea. Uh, yeah, and a lot of employers don't mind. Uh, number seven is impulsivity. And, you know, this is where Ugh. you would, yeah, and losing your temper or, you know, 
impulsive with an employee. You want to, one of the biggest tips is to really practice relaxation and meditation techniques, anticipate those problems and practice what you can do if it happens. Like if something triggers something, what you can do, uh, practicing self-talk or work with a coach. So that is tough. Breathing. Breathing, relaxation, breathing, drinking water. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Boredom is number eight. Um, (laughs) um, There are some jobs that can be really boring. Routine tasks. So set a timer, use a timer to stay on task, break up your task and drink water and get up and walk around if you need to. Mm -hmm. Number nine is hyperactivity. And this again, you know, take, if you feel like you're being super hyper right now in a job that's somewhat sedentary, get up, take a break, walk around, take notes in a meeting. If you feel restless, write everything down. You know, if you're feeling really anxious in a meeting, just write my, I'll never forget. And you as a lawyer, I'm sure you have doodle pads that have their own doodle pads. Yeah. And every lawyer I meet has doodle pads because they're constantly in meetings that are just so boring. And so they're doodling all the time. And bring lunch. You know, take a walk at lunchtime. Get exercise during the day. Run up and down the stairs because that's going to really help you with that restlessness and that feeling. And then the last one is interpersonal and social skills. And I know one of your people asked about that. And it's really important to learn about how you pick up on social cues, uh, work with a coach, and also really, you know, ask for feedback. Ask for feedback from your supervisor. How am I doing? Am I interrupting too much? Am I talking too much? You don't have to say that you have ADHD. You know, and that's such an interesting comment because I don't think many of us would think to ask our boss, am I interrupting too much? Am I talking too fast? Am I, but you know what? Those are really, those are really good questions. Yeah. And your boss. If you can actually receive the information without getting all defensive. Exactly. And that's, you know, that's why, and you're coming from a part of strength. You're saying to your boss, I want to be the best employee I can be. Can you, you know, what do you think about how I am? How could I do it better? And I think most people would never ask their boss that question. So Mm. I would, I think it would be endearing. Like the, you know, the boss would be like, oh my gosh, she really cares. Yes. Yes. She wants to be better. Just what you just said. Okay. (laughs) Well, Lynn, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge here with us today. You are So if you want to learn more about you? Where can they find you? And is there anything special that you're working on that you want to tell us about? Well, thank you for asking. They can find me. My website is lmrcoaching.com. Lynn Minor Rosen. And I will have that in our show notes. And I'm also on social media. I love everybody to follow me. I'm on Instagram at ADHD Coach Lynn. And I'm working on a couple of different projects. But what I'm really trying to do is take this information about careers that adults want to know about and really help young people before they enter the workplace on the, some strategies that are going to help them succeed and also strategies to help them realize that they can do anything they want to do. And I want your audience to know that there is no such thing as the perfect ADHD job. <laughs> no such thing. So it's really about you and what motivates you and what you love. Well, and that's why we have to have you back because that seems to be a big question. You know, how to figure that out for yourself. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you again, Lynn. Sure, We've learned my so pleasure. Much from this conversation. And that is what we have for you for this week. As always, you are listening to ADHD for Smart Ass Women. If you like this episode with Lynn Minor Rosen, please let us know by leaving a review. My goal is to change the conversation around ADHD, helping as many women as I possibly can learn how their ADHD brains work and discover their amazing strengths. Your reviews, they really help in that regard. So 
If you have a comment, a guest you'd like me to interview, or a topic idea for this podcast, you can go to my website at tracyoutsuka.com and leave me an audio message or reach out to me at tracy at tracyoutsuka.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Atsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Play. If you liked what you heard, we sure would appreciate a review. And not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, well, that's also the name of our free Facebook group. Go look it up. We're a totally smart ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. We'd love to have you join us. You can also find all my details over at tracyoutsuka.com. Don't forget, I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week.